Hello, my name is Susan Winkelstein and I'm a funeral director with Chicago Jewish Funerals. We're about to begin the services for Mrs. Shirley A. Levins. Officiating this morning is Rabbi James Sagarin. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Adonai mi yagur bohalecha, mi ishkon bohar kodshecha, holech tani mofored tzedek, bedover emet bilvavo, lo ragal alishono lo asa lrehu raa, vecherpa lo nasa al krovo. God, who may live in your house? Who may dwell in your holy mountain? Those who are upright, who do justly, who speak truth within their hearts. Those who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them. Those who scorn the lawless but honor those who revere God. Those who give their word and, and come what may do not retract. Those who do not exploit others. Those who do not take bribes. Those who live in this way shall never be shaken, and let us say Amen. We'll continue with the 23rd Psalm, which is also in your in your little pamphlet here. Uh, I will read the English, and then we can, excuse me, I will read the Hebrew, and then we'll read the English together. Adonai ro'i lo echsav, bino desher yarbitzeni ame menuchot tinahaleni. Nafshi Yeshovev, Gan Cheni B'makalei Tzedek L'ma'an Shemo. Gam Ki Elek B'geitza L'mavet Lo Irara Ki Ata Imadi. Shivtecha U'mishantecha Hema Yenachamuni. Taroch L'fanai Shuchan Neged Tzorarai. Tishanta V'ashemen Roshi Kosi Ravaya. Ach Tov V'chesed, Yerdafuni Kol Yemei Chayai, if you wish to join, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And let us all say, Amen. When we say amen, it means we agree that, that we are aligned with God. And in that, in that fashion, uh, we, we hopefully face our lives as well, knowing God is with us at all times. Esa enai el heharim neayin yavu ezri. Ezri me'im Adonai ose shamayim v'aretz. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My, my help will come from God, the maker of heaven and earth. God will not let your foot give way. Your protector will not slumber. Behold, the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. God is your guardian. God is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. God will guard you from all harm. God will guard your soul, your going and coming, now and forever. Amen. We continue with a section from uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, showing us sort of the balance in life, and, and that we rejoice in all of it, that we as creations, uh, God has given us the ability to partake in the fullness of life. For everything there is a season, 
a time for every experience under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot that which is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Eshet chayel miyimsa rachok mipnimi michra v'atach ba'alev ba'ala v'shala lo yechsav. A woman of valor who can find such a woman. She is more precious than pearls. Her husband trusts in her and he lacks for nothing. She does him good, never harm all the days of her life. She receives, she perceives that her labor is rewarding. Her candle burns long into the night. She reaches out to those in need and extends her hands to the poor. She is she's clothed in strength and dignity, and, and she faces the future cheerfully. She speaks with wisdom. The law of kindness is on her lips. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband sings her praises. Many daughters have done valiantly, but you exceed them all. In the rising of the sun and when it goes down, we shall remember her. In the blowing of the winds and in the chill of the winter, we shall remember her. In the opening of buds and the rebirth of the spring, we shall remember her. In the rustling of leaves and the beauty of fall, we shall remember her. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we shall always remember her. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember her. When we are lost and sick at heart, we shall remember her. When we have joys we yearn to share, we shall remember her. So long as we all live, she too shall live, for she is now a part of us, and we will always remember her. Amen. We continue now with our, with our speakers today. So we call up uh, Karen is, is, is here. Okay, so Aunt Shirley was amazing. She went to school and worked while raising her sons, which was very unusual for someone in her generation and her background. Generations of Illinoisans are better communicators and better writers because of her. She was incredibly well-read and very analytical. The discussions about politics and society around the Thanksgiving table were loud and animated and always interesting. Aunt Shirley was highly opinionated, and I have no doubt that had she been born 50 years later, she would be a professor or a judge or would be running a nonprofit. Ronnie, who wrote most of this text, has very fond memories of going to the theater with Aunt Shirley. Aunt Shirley would find obscure little um, uh, plays in Evanston or on the north side and take Ronnie there. Afterward, Aunt Shirley would want to discuss the play and would ask Ronnie about the play itself, the plot, the characters, and the acting. Once, Aunt Shirley arranged for our family to meet her and Dave at the Court Theater at the University of Chicago for a play there. Just driving down there was an adventure. Ronnie and all of us saw a part of the city that we never knew. Years later, when Ronnie worked at uh, U of C, U Chicago and parked in the garage near the court theater. She always thought of that bright, sunny summer day. One summer, when our parents went away for a week, Jerry and I went to the Ticos, but Ronnie went to stay with Aunt Shirley. Aunt Shirley signed Ronnie up for camp for a few days, a camp where Corey worked as a counselor, and then she took off a few days of work to be with Ronnie. Ronnie remembers that time very fondly. And Shirley talked to her about things that we never discussed in our family, about work and college and all sorts of subjects that were new. 
Ronnie also met with Aunt Shirley and Uncle High in Israel. She was studying there when they took the trip. And they also met in Brooklyn when High went to visit the foundry. For her, those experiences, meeting Shirley far away from Birchwood Avenue or Bluff helped to get to know her a little better. All of us have very, very fond memories of Thanksgiving and Seders together. Ronnie has done a lot to keep up the tradition, but we all need to try harder now. We should have listened better and taken notes when Aunt Shirley and Dave talked about growing up. They had such interesting childhoods so different from ours. Let's keep their legacy alive by staying together and documenting what we remember. Aunt Shirley and Uncle High sacrificed for a better life for their families and they both succeeded with flying colors. Aunt Shirley was an important role model. We love her. Rest in peace. Okay, great. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tara. I'm Corey's oldest and one of Shirley's grandchildren. Um, and thinking about grandma and reflecting on my memories of her, and two key attributes kept coming up in my mind. At first, grandma always made sure that we all knew how much she loved us and how proud of us she was. Everything we did was amazing. No accomplishment was too small to celebrate. And in her mind, everyone else ought to have known how amazing we all were too. As many of you know, Teva and I were big swimmers growing up. And one year when I was nine or 10 years old, I think, uh, grandma and grandpa had come to visit us in California toward the end of the summer when we had our summer league championship. At the end of season awards banquet, the coaches would give out a high point award for the swimmer in each age group that earned the most points throughout the season. That year, I had edged a teammate out for the high point award by just half a point, and it was the first time I had ever won the award and the first time that my teammate had not won the award. Uh, grandma and my parents found me after the ceremony as I was standing in line for cake, and grandma gave me a big hug and loudly exclaimed how proud of me she was, how she couldn't believe it had come down to just half a point, what that other girl must have been feeling only for my dad to uh, politely point out that my teammate was in fact standing right behind us. And grandma in true grandma form uh, looked at her, sort of raised her eyes and shrugged her shoulders and just turned back to me. Um, Barry also shared a memory with me um, that she wanted me to share with all of you today. Barry remembers that when she was a little, little kid, every time that she would go to grandma's, she would ask grandma, do you have a present for me? And grandma almost always did, usually a puzzle or a book. And grandma and Rita used to take Lauren and Barry ice skating into ballets. I think that all of the grandkids have similar memories of an abundance of presents, outings, gifts, hugs, and grandmotherly love. The second key attribute that would come up is that grandma made sure that we also all knew that family comes first. Family Thanksgiving was a sacred time to her, and I have vivid memories of her standing over the sink making her stuffing, or carefully slicing up dozens of apples for her sugar-free apple pie, or braving the masses at Water Tower Place to take us to the American Girl store, no matter how cold or how crowded it was. And for two Thanksgivings in particular, I think we all remember when Grandma had us dress in our color-coordinated outfits, black and white one year and shades of blue the next, and head into the photo studio for family portraits. I know that we all gave her a hard time back then, but it has been so wonderful to have those over the years and to see them featured prominently at my parents' house and at her house on Birchwood and at the apartment. I think we also all remember grandma's exasperation sometimes at the number of laptops and the amount of time that we all spent on them working uh, during later Thanksgivings. And perhaps that was her way of saying that we should have been appreciating and taking advantage of our time together. And once again, I think we would all agree that she was right. That pride and that love remained loud and clear over the past few years, even when her voice often did not. Over FaceTime or through Elza and Sally and Lika, we learned to recognize when grandma was telling us that she was proud of us and that she loved us, whether it was through her eyes or a squeeze of her hand when we visited. But what I realize now that it's too late is that in typical grandkid form, I didn't tell her enough how much I loved her. And I never told her how proud I was of her. Because without her hard work and sacrifice, 
none of our successes would have been possible. She worked so hard to raise three boys while also pursuing her own education and career to make sure that they and that all of us would be better off than she was. Everything that she did, she did for us and for our family. And despite losing her mobility and then her voice, she never lost that spirit. May her memory be a blessing and also a reminder to always appreciate the family time that we are fortunate to have and to always tell each other how much we love one another and how proud we are of one another. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Karen. And for all of those who are, who are watching and wondering, yes, that was an original High Levin's painting over Tara's shoulder. In eulogizing mom, I'm going to focus on what I believe were the two core elements of her life and being, her, her quest for knowledge and her Jewish identity. In honoring mom's incredible life, I have to begin with the amazing change that occurred during her life, which began in 1925 as the first of two children of poor Jewish immigrant parents from the old country who spoke little or no English, who owned no telephone, no car, had no money, virtually no possessions, at a time when horse-drawn carts were still in use, when ice was delivered to the door, vegetables and food were sold from carts in the street. And an amazing irony, her life is ending with a funeral service streaming over the internet. I like to say that mom was a charter member of what has deservedly been referred to as the greatest generation. If mom had been born later and was a young woman today, she would no doubt be an attorney or a business executive or a senator, or as Karen says, the head of a nonprofit. She would be quite simply her granddaughters for her granddaughters and grandchildren are very much the embodiment of the values and wisdom and experience and of all her other finer qualities. At mom's core, what made mom who she was, was the desire to learn and her never ending quest for knowledge. The quest for knowledge came in many forms. Growing up, my brothers and I and our friends and especially our wives experienced mom's third degree at one time or another. Whenever we embarked on a new venture, met a new person, started a new job, she needed to know all there was to know about everything and anything we did and anyone we were involved with. It wasn't an effort at being nosy or interfering in our lives, though it may have been her frustrated litigator personality. Rather, it was an effort to understand us and the people who were important to us, to stay connected, be relevant, and to share as much as possible in the successes and failures of our lives Maybe she wanted to make sure we were safe and secure as well. Without question, it was motivated by incredible love. The quest for knowledge is what led her to graduate at the top of her high school class, to start a book club with a couple of other mothers of classmates of mine in sixth grade, to make sure there was a complete set of great books of the Western world in the house, the writings on which college curriculums are based, to teach English in a junior high school before moving on to being a hearing officer, really a judge, at the Illinois Department of Public Aid at which she worked for almost 20 years, to co-teaching a course at the Morton Grove Community Center after she retired, and always to read, read, and read. And the quest for knowledge extended to an appreciation for the arts. Mom and dad for many years had seasons tickets to the Chicago Symphony, Lyric Opera, Goodman and Steppenwolf theaters, and patronized the local arts as well. Classical music was always playing in the house, Many of you witnessed dad's expression of their love for the music in the orchestra as he sculpted. Unfortunately, in the 1940s, in the culture and times she grew up in, a woman graduating high school was generally considered to have completed her education. Women in mom's socioeconomic group were not expected to continue their studies into college. So after school, mom had a few jobs that you associated with a young woman at the time. And after the war, she met a handsome young man who looked, as she later told me, even more dashing in his army uniform, married him and started a family and had three boys. She put everything, all her love, wisdom, judgment, and caring into raising those three boys. And make no mistake, in our family, mom was the boss. And dad, to his credit, knew it. And he never stopped marveling at her or his amazing good fortune at finding this remarkable woman to whom he was married for 73 years until he died last year. 
As we got older, mom found she had more time on her hands and was able finally to do what she had always wished she could have done when she was younger. Approaching 40 years old with three children long before it was anywhere near heard of. Mom took her quest for knowledge and went back to school. And in 1970, at the age of 45, the same year that I graduated from junior high school and Dave graduated from high school and Jeff was a junior in college, mom finally earned her Bachelor of Arts in English. Mom was always seemed to be ahead of her time, always one or more steps ahead of us and what she was thinking and how she processed information. When I was little, mom was a heavy smoker, but when she read the first trickle of stories that got through the tobacco companies in the early 60s about how smoking could be dangerous, she quit cold turkey. She told me years later that the thought of shortening her life and having less time with her children was unthinkable. She never smoked another cigarette. When Jeff was in high school in the 60s and got his driver's license, he was determined on getting a motorcycle. I was about 10 years old at the time. And I remember the arguments though. Mom rarely denied us our reasonable requests, but she knew well before the statistics on motorcycles became widely known that this was something Jeffrey should not be doing. Jeff may have been mad, but later in life, he begrudgingly admitted to me she was right. And the quest for knowledge came into play maybe more than anywhere else in the political arena, in the stands she took, her opinions, the movements she endorsed, her influence on the family discussions at the dinner table. In sixth grade, as the Vietnam was starting to rage out of control, I had a teacher who was pro-war and took great umbrage at my intentional show of disrespect during the morning Pledge of Allegiance, as I would slouch and lean on my desk during the recitation of the pledge. Eventually, after several warnings, the teacher called mom in for a conference. Years later, I asked mom what happened at that conference because I certainly did not experience any repercussions. She simply said, I told her to never waste my time like that again. The war was a scary time in our house and I remember the discussions mom and dad had about all of us moving to Canada because there was no way they would let Jeff be drafted to fight in an unjust war and no way they would let the family be separated. Fortunately, Jeff's lottery number was 366 and the issue became moot that they were prepared to make the stand and dad was a proud member of Veterans Against the War. The same could be said about mom and dad's views on civil liberties, women's rights, human rights. Their views were based on knowledge, on caring for people, on doing whatever they could to make a world better for their children, and they were always ahead of their times. Throughout her life, mom embraced change and adapted to the change around her, from automobiles to radio to television to computers. She may have struggled, as we all do, with some of that technology, but she embraced those inv inventions because she saw them as making her quest for knowledge that much more attainable. While I sometimes wonder what she would have achieved if she were a young woman in today's world, I believe, as I said before, I will learn the answer to that question as I watch my children grow older and pursue their goals and dreams. The younger generation will build on the foundations of what she started. The other core element of mom's being was her Jewish identity and having described the importance of the quest for knowledge and learning in mom's life, this element is much more easily dealt with. For while mom was active later in life with the synagogue and was president, I believe, of the sisterhood, I'm quite sure she was ambivalent on the existence of God. But being Jewish for her and for us was not about praying, it was not about bowing down to God, rather it was about the learning the quest for knowledge for knowledge's sake, and using that knowledge to become a better person and create a better society. It was about the kind of discussion and discourse and give and take found in the Talmud, but brought down to modern times. And in that regard, mom was the paragon of what we believed a Jew should be and what being Jewish means. Most importantly, she successfully passed those ideals on to her sons and through us to her grandchildren. She was quite simply the essence of Jewishness and everything I strive to be as a Jew. I'm gonna to try to, uh, uh, as I speak, I'm going to uh, abbreviate some of my comments because they uh, uh, reinforce what others have said better than I can say it. 
you know, mom's death has filled us with, with the sadness and this terrible pandemic has intercepted our ability to, to mourn together, to hug, to cry, and to laugh at memories and stories that need to be told and, and retold. But in a strange way, it's, it's also fitting that we remember mom like this because she never particularly liked being the center of attention. And as mentioned, it's a bit ironic that we're being brought together by computer as every Thanksgiving, she would indeed issue an edict, edict, no computers today. It was a feudal edict. She was devoted to family and she took nachas in the achievements of her kids, her nieces, nephews, and her grandkids. And, and she, she really loved the time when the family all got together. As we've heard, she was a woman of many and formidable talents. Her intelligence was obvious to all. Her speech was understated and dignified. Um, Corey and I were, were trying to remember whether she was the valedictorian uh, of, of her class at Marshall High. If, if she wasn't, she should have been. And that we don't remember if she was is more of a testament to her humility than, than uh, to our poor memories. And as we've noted with her talents in today's world, she would have gone straight to college and who knows, uh, might have joined Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. We've heard that she went back to school and graduated and it should be noted that her transcript in college was monotonous, just a string of A's. She had incredible energy. And this is something that I didn't really appreciate as a kid. She was always busy. Time was something valuable and, and to be used. She was always knitting, crocheting. I think her kids and her grandkids today still wrap themselves in comforters she made. She gardened. And actually, she and my brothers, I think somewhat un unfairly, claimed that her gardening led to my academic success. Every time she asked me to help in the yard, they say that I suddenly remember that I had homework. And because mom valued education far too much, she let me get away with that lame excuse. She read incessantly, and she read good stuff, not fluff or pulp. Who but a graduate student in American or English literature would have devoured the works of Faulkner or Joseph Conrad? And she read everything. She read fiction, history, politics, Jewish literature, Jewish studies, and she remembered it all and loved discussing it. She was also a true patriot. She believed in America and its potential. Every year, she was an official poll worker. And in this current year, we all know the importance that those citizens play. After she retired from the Illinois uh, Department of Public Aid, she led a humanities discussion group and, and, and arranged engaging and enriching activities for her friends. She once actually asked me to give a talk uh, to her discussion group about DNA gene cloning and its effect, future effects on medicine. Among her many gifts, though, was one that always amazed Corey and Jeff and me, and that was her ESP. Despite the wide differences in time zones and our variable schedules, she had a remarkable ability to call us all right in the middle of dinner. She liked to shop, and I think she was very happy when Dave and Chemda had Karen and Ronnie, and later Barry, Tara, and Teva, that she could take them on excursions. And although she liked to shop, she was never a spendthrift. She appreciated a bargain. In 2003, during the run-up to the invasion of Iraq, of Iraq, she was in London with Jeff and Vera and Sammy. While fleeing an angry and violent anti-U.S. demonstration in London's Hyde Park, she stopped and noted that a nearby produce shop had good prices on fresh strawberries. 
Mom had a sense of humor that was dry and Thurber-esque. And I could read to you, well, I will read to you, an, a, a lightly edited email that she sent out from an experience. So in, in, at the end of uh, 2004, mom had a very small stroke deep in the brain in, in a structure called the thalamus. And it left her feeling cold all the time. So she decided to head to Florida for the winter. And there she became the library terrorist. Dad dropped me off at the library where I returned three video cassettes in the Dropbox at the entrance and went to use a computer. I finished checking out what I primarily came to do and found I had plenty of time left to send some emails. Dad returned before I was through, so I prevailed upon him to wait inside the library where there are comfortable chairs and a pleasant seating space. All of a sudden, an announcement came over the loudspeaker that the library was being quarantined and no one would be allowed to leave or enter. So I continued to compose emails to family and friends. There was a rumor going around the room that some kind of white powder had been found. I began to sense an uneasiness in the room. Paper and pencils were passed around and everyone in the library was required to sign their name, address, and phone number. I continued to compose emails because none of these goings on had anything to do with me. After more than an hour, fire trucks and police cars are outside of the library and the entrance is cordoned off with yellow police tape. There was talk that the white powder was determined to be Johnson's baby powder and they are starting to screen people, slowly allowing them to leave. Dad and I got in the exit line, waiting our turn to be cleared and leave. The police officer is making sure everyone who is allowed to leave has signed the list. Finally, it is my turn and I give him my name. He looks at me and yells out loudly, Shirley Levins. I look at him and thought, do I know you? As he again yells out loudly, Shirley Levins. Are you Shirley Levins? Then he yells to an officer standing next to him, this is Shirley Levins. Then he asked me if I had returned a video and I said I had. He asked me the name and I told him it was Man on Fire. And he yells out, that's it. It appears I was the culprit. They claimed that the powder was found on a video I returned. I stared at him in fear and amazement and stammered out that I have no baby powder nor any knowledge of any baby, baby powder. He pondered for a moment and let us go. There I was in the library the whole time Homeland Security was looking for the library terrorist. I, I, I love this little story. Mom is among us here and she will be among those who follow us. The strands of her life are fine silk, fine silk delicate but long and strong. Entwined with those strands are strands of her husband is 73 years high. They join and bind the threads of her children and grandchildren and join with the fibers of family, friends and community in an American tapestry. Her strands add wisdom, strength, and beauty, and grace to the fabric. No one can ever span the full tapestry, but the tapestry endures. And as one of her favorite writers, Faulkner, said, I believe that man will not merely endure, he will prevail. He is immortal, not because he alone among creatures has an inexhaustible voice, but because he has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion, compassion, sacrifice, and endurance. That's mom, compassion, sacrifice, and endurance. Uh, would you please rise? El Male Rahamin, Shochem Bam Romim, Hamse Menucha Nechona, Tahat Hanfe Ashkina, Im Kudoshim. Toharim Kazor Havakia Masiri Ed Nishma and Mrs. Shirley Levins Shahal Hal Olama Baha Rahamim Yastireha Beseter Knafav Lo Olamim Vitror Vitror Rahim at Nishmata Adonai Hu Nahalata Vitanoak Vishalom Al Mishkava Vnomar Amen. Let us join in Kaddish, uh, a prayer that is said to uh, honor those who have passed, but also to affirm life 
and, and the gift that Mrs. Levins was. Kaddish may be found on your your handouts as well. Yit kadal v'yit kadash shmei rabat v'olma tivra chirute v'yamlich malchute v'chayechon u'v'yom echon u'v'chaye dekol beit Yisrael v'agada v'zman karib imru amen yehe shmei rabam v'arach leolam olmei olmaya yit barach v'yishtavach v'yit pa'ar v'yit romam Vietnase, Vietadar, Vitale, Vitalar, Shve, the Kudusha, Berihu. The Elo Minho, Birhata, Vishirata, Tush Muhata, Venehamata, the Amiran, the Alma, the Imru, Amen. Yehe Shlama, Rabba, Minshamaya, Vahayim, Aleno, Vahol, Israel, the Imru, Amen. O Se Shalom, Bimromav. Who ya say shalom, aleinu v'yal kol Yisrael, v'imru amen. May God who creates peace in the heavens, grant peace for all of the household of Israel, peace for all of us here assembled, and peace for all the world, as we join in saying amen. This is earth taken from the land of Israel. So we put the earth to signify uh, surely belonging to, to the Jewish people and our history and traditions.
crew are invited to place three uh, shovels, shovelfuls of sand on the grave as an indication of your final act of kindness towards your aunt, your grandmother, your mother, and friend. And flower, uh, please take a flower as well to place on the grave. This does conclude the services at the graveside. We do encourage you to share your personal condolences and stories of Mrs. Levins at chicagojewishfunerals.com or legacy.com. Take care.